The Battle of Midway, presented by Corey Booth, PhD student, Liberty University. Hello fellow historians, my name is Corey Booth. My project subject is the Battle of Midway. The battle occurred from June 4th to June 7th in 1942, northeast of the Midway Atoll in North Central Pacific Ocean. The battle occurred over seven months after the Japanese surprise attack at Pearl Harbor that nearly decimated the U.S. Pacific Naval Fleet and it officially drug the United States into World War II. The battle has been immortalized in two movies and numerous books and articles over the years. At the time, it was not as clear as it is today just how important the American victory was over the Imperial Japanese forces. The victory was celebrated at the time, but its significance could not be fully appreciated until the war was over in the Pacific. Essentially, the Imperial, the imperial military was forced into a defensive posture until Imperial Hirohito surrendered in, in Tokyo Bay aboard the deck of the US, USS Missouri. There is a national monument for the event located at the Midway Atoll, and I believe it should stay there. However, I also believe we should enshrine the battle that turned away imperialism in the Pacific in a more central location. We should have a commemorative monument, an exact replica of the one at Midway placed in Washington, D.C., near the current World War II Memorial. This is not to diminish any other battle, but rather to distinguish this battle and the significance of this event in the course of American history. In the following slides, we will travel through the event through newspaper headlines, oral stories from men who were there at Midway, the military intelligence breakthrough that led to the battle at Midway, and why this battle matters to me. Who was Admiral Chester Nimitz? Admiral Nimitz was the U.S. Naval Pacific Fleet Commander during World War II. He was an integral component of the U.S. victory over the Imperial forces in the Pacific Theater. This document is from January 1942. About six months before the battle, and just over a month after Pearl Harbor, is the official document indicating Admiral Nimitz being promoted to the Pacific Fleet Commander. The official date of promotion was January 14, 1942, and was ordered by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is the official proclamation of Admiral Nimitz becoming Fleet Commander Pacific Fleet in World War II. This is significant because it is a document that states when Nimitz was promoted and what the President believed about his new fleet commander. Admiral Nimitz would prove to be the right choice to lead American naval forces against the Imperial Naval Forces of Japan. I located a collection of letters in the Jerry Falwell Library written by Admiral Nimitz before he was accepted into the Naval Academy. Admiral Nimitz was the Pacific Fleet Naval Commander during World War II, and it was under his leadership that the American Naval Forces recovered from the attack at Pearl Harbor and then ultimately defeated the Japanese in the Pacific Theater. Inside the source, there were a few mundane letters concerning grades and how training was going at school. The one that I found that was interesting was this one here, where he writes his father and shares the good news of being accepted, though barely, into the United States Naval Academy. Luckily for the Americans and the world, the admission representatives at the U.S. Naval Academy deemed young Chester's hearing to be adequate enough so he would be able to enter the academy and begin his illustrious naval career and thusly earn his place in the annals of American history. Admiral Nimitz was a humble man, but others spoke very highly of him. One article written by Admiral William Platt describes Admiral Nimitz as a thoughtful, driven, and smart naval commander who was the reason the U.S. were successful in the Pacific, but was a humble man who let those he, who he commanded receive the spotlight for their actions. The article I found appeared in Newsweek before the war ended and stated that Admiral Nimitz would not stop until Americans stood in Japan. The next article I located was written about a year before the Japanese surrender as an interview about the current operations in the Marianas and what was the next battle location. This was an interview conducted by Admiral Nimitz, of Admiral Nimitz, excuse me. The Admiral would not say where they were going next or how long he thought the war might last, but he did say that without a victory at Midway, there would not have been any battles in the Western Pacific. The next article is written by Admiral Nimitz in his own words and describes how important sea power, which is the command and control of the seas, is so vital for national security. While this article is not specific to Midway, it does shine a light on how Admiral Nimitz views naval strength and why it was vital to defeating imperialism in World War II. History demonstrates that these countries, but those countries which have made wise use of sea power, have flourished, whereas the contrary is true of those countries who misunderstood its use and magnitude. In any conflict, 
the tenets for success are timeless, and according to Nimitz, the principle for victory is deep-seated, and for a maritime nation like the United States, sea power is the fundamental component in that principle. News reporting, while sometimes inaccurate in the moment, can give a view into how the war was portrayed and how battles may be advancing as reported back home. These articles I have found that I located in the Jerry Falwell, Jerry Falwell Library will be presented chronologically to give some order to the reporting. The battle only lasted four days, but the articles concerning Midway lasted for months. The first article appeared in the New York Times ahead of Mother's Day, about a month before the Battle of Midway. Nimitz, Nimitz encourages the mothers of the sailors to be steadfast and understand that the war may be lengthy. He also mentions that their sons may not survive, but should be proud of their sons, like his own, who, have, who may give the supreme sacrifice for the defense of their country. On June 6th, the Sun reported that the battle was progressing well and gave a list of ships. The last paragraph is interesting, especially given the significance that Midway would become. And the paper lamented that the loss of Midway would not be significant because we had Hawaii, which could be used to protect Australia. On June 8th, a small Associated Press blurb discussing China's reverence for Admiral Nimitz, who was in the process of defeating their Nimitz's Japan, Japan at Midway Island. The Chinese were becoming fans of the Admiral and his drive to end imperialism in the region. Another article from the Times Digital Archive on June 8th gave a brief synopsis of the battle through its ship loss count, though not completely accurate. It does indicate the Japanese are losing the battle for Midway. The article also discussed the importance of the island and the questions and questions why the Japanese would want to attack such remote outposts unless its goal was complete dominance in the entire Pacific Ocean. This article describes the desire of the Imperial forces succinctly. The next brief article includes a picture and event uh, that it was reporting on. Men were often awarded medals in battle, and this picture and small blurb illustrates that event. What is significant about this? Well, the significance is about Doris Miller is that he is African American, and this was 1942. In war and at the Battle of Midway, race did not seem to matter, but after the war, race differences would continue to plague the United States. The next article I found had a more of a Japanese view. It was also, although it was reported uh, by the New York Times, they were discussing that the Japanese were not accustomed to being defeated in battle. Excuse me, defeated in battle. And this article from June 10th, just two days after the battle ended, indicates that the news organizations in Japan were preparing their readers for the bad news of the lost battle. The article reminds the readers that they have lost ships before, but must remember to remain calm and that the war would be long. News report broke a five-day silence by Japanese news agencies. The next article I located is a two-page article that details how Midway was bombed by the Japanese initially, but then the Americans were able to locate the Japanese aircraft carriers and defeat them. Once they were located, the Americans successfully sunk all four carriers along with numerous cruisers, destroyers, and supporting vessels. The article continues and discusses the dogfights and how the Americans were able to eventually fight the Japanese flyers and earn a victory over the Imperial forces at Japan. The article gives a vague chip loss number by the Japanese and states that over 200 warplanes were destroyed by the American forces. By now, the next article was after Midway and the news was moving on. There were more battles to discuss, but Midway was still important. The short article which appeared on page 18 when before the articles were on page one or two, the New York Times illustrates how quickly the news for the war was moving. The article is about Colonel Walter Sweeney Jr., who was a commander of the Flying Fortresses, which was vital at the Battle of Midway. It was, was a type of propaganda that was usually utilized to keep spirits up at the home front while also showcasing the strength of the, mili of the American military. Having the nation behind the war effort was extremely important, especially since many everyday items are being rationed for the war effort at home. Next article of the New York Times discusses some interviews that were conducted with the aviators who operated the scout planes who were looking for the Japanese fleet initially. They discussed the monotony of the search changed dramatically on the morning when on the morning of June the 4th, the Japanese fleet was discovered to the west of the island. This location allowed the American aviators on the decks of the aircraft carriers to, to launch and attack the fleet and eventually would lead to the defeat of the Japanese. The interview was conducted by telephone, and again, this is 1942, so the technology was, uh, was cutting edge almost with telephone. But the telephone call was with the commander of the squadron and six pilots who were off duty. Interesting.
thing the article stated that the airmen only slept about two hours a night in their pursuit to accomplish their mission. The next article was written by Charles Hurd. He gives the sobering news that the Yorktown aircraft carrier had been bombed and was sunk. But the crippled aircraft carrier, the crippled, this crippled, excuse me, this crippled the air power in the Pacific, but did not completely stifle the progress of the American forces and that, that the American forces make in the region. There was an effort to get the Yorktown of Pearl Harbor to be repaired, but the ship was, tor was torpedoed and sunk. Luckily, most of the crew managed to escape, so the loss of life was minimal. This news article, the next news article, is a report by the Naval Department's final report of the battle. It also, too, is found on page 18 of the Sun, which illustrates that the war was continuing, even though the battle was important. More breaking news, though, was being reported earlier in the newspaper. The article is a brief synopsis of the partnership between the Army, Navy, and Marines at Midway, and, is, and it is not short of stirring phrases like heroic deeds and intrepid spirit of the pilots. The article is a great summary of what occurred in early June 1942. While the news reports clamor that it was a great battle, it would be three more years before the war would end in Tokyo Bay. This action report was completed in September of 1942, was not declassified until June 6 of 1985. This is an action report completed during the battle. This report was sent on June 5, 1942 by the RDO, or Regional Duty Officer, to Midway Command. This is the first report on the Japanese carriers all being lost in the battle. While this report is important, the significance of the message would not be clear until later in the war as the American forces pushed the Japanese naval forces back into a more defensive posture. Thinking of the four Japanese carriers was a critical turning point in the Pacific theater because prior to this point, the Americans have been beaten badly at every opportunity by the Japanese. I was able to locate some oral interviews of gentlemen who had fought in the Battle of Midway. My first one was a 124 minute oral interview conducted by Dr. Bruce Petty, who was interviewing Abe Santos, who was a fireman aboard USS Astoria. Santos was in numerous battles, including Midway. Eventually, his ship was sunk in a later battle in the Pacific. He describes watching the dogfights on the deck of his ship at, Mad at Midway. One flyer named Bruce O'Hare became an ace in Midway. Abe joked that every time they saw a Japanese plane go down, they would say, there's old Bruce. Bruce would eventually have an airport named after him in Chicago. Interesting. Next interview was an 88-minute oral interview conducted by Dr. William Day Alexander, who was interviewing Harold Placette, who was a radio man aboard the USS Phelps. Posset had been at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked, and he talked about the concussion of the Arizona as it exploded and how they could feel that aboard his ship. He went to the Coral Sea and then on to Midway, where he witnessed dogfighting and hear the pilots as they fought out to Japanese planes. He was also escorting the Yorktown when it was torpedoed. The next one is an 81-minute 80, oral interview conducted by Kathy Matras, who was, who was interviewing Ronald Veltman, who was a corpsman aboard the USS Hornet. He witnessed the Doolittle planes taking off for their air raid and later was in Midway. He discussed how badly shot up uh, he discussed how a badly shot up plane landed on the deck of the Hornet and its 50 caliber guns went off and killed eight people on the deck. As it got dark on June the 6th, there was radio silence. None of the planes could talk to each other and they could not communicate with the ship. This made it difficult to ascertain their position or number of planes returning. Veltman recalls the order Commander Mitchell to Veltman recalls the order. Commander Mitchell gave to turn on their searchlights and point them straight up as a beacon for the planes. Soon the planes started coming in because of the searchlights. The next interview was a 42 minute oral interview conducted by Dr. Frank Trakowski. He was interviewing William Roy, who was the photographer's mate aboard the USS Yorktown. He photographed many events, including dogfights, planes taking off and landing, offloading of woman of offloading of wounded in the USS Yorktown as it tried to return to Pearl Harbor after the Battle of Midway. He was able to save three tens of film and dozens of photographs when he evacuated the Yorktown after it was torpedoed and sunk. Many of the images of the battle were taken by Roy that we see today. The next was an 85-minute 80 85 minute oral interview conducted by Dr. Richard Mesenheimer, who was interviewing John Underwood, who was aboard the USS Yorktown when it was finally torpedoed and sunk. John gives an account of grabbing his watch, ring, and his poker winnings before abandoning ship. Interestingly, Underwood, like many, joined the Navy at a younger age. He joined at age 15. He lied about his age so he could join the fight, he said. Another oral interview was a 121-minute interview conducted by Dr. Forrest Rees, who was interviewing Justin Brody, 
who was an aviation ordinanceman aboard USS Yorktown. He witnessed the sinking of the USS Lexington at Coral Sea and was on the USS Yorktown when it was also torpedoed. He discussed how the Japanese, Japanese planes were looking for their carriers and not, really, and not realizing they were sunk. As it got dark, the Japanese had to turn on their lights, which made them easy targets for the gunners of the Americans. He states that he saw nearly 30 planes, including one that tried to land on the Yorktown, shot down that evening. The next oral interview is a 79-minute oral interview conducted by Dr. Kenneth Thompson, who was speaking with Sam Laser. Sam was a yeoman gunner on the USS Yorktown. He was on the ship at the Battle of Coral Sea at the Battle of Midway before being injured in a dive bomb attack on the carrier. He was topside at his station attempting to fend off the Japanese air attacks when he saw the bomb being released in the plane and it landed behind him in the boiler room. He was injured in that explosion and would be sent back to Hawaii to recuperate before being reassigned stateside. The next oral interview was a 55 was a 54 minute interview conducted by Dr. William Cox, who was interviewing Harry Ferrier who was assigned to an Avenger crew as a radio man aboard the USS Hornet. He was a member of a torpedo plane that was active at Midway. His plane was shot up and eventually made it back to Midway where it crash landed. He and the pilot were only survivors from the squadron. They were the first wave to hit the Japanese at 7 a.m. on June 4th, the first day of the battle. Finally, the last oral interview was a 76 minute interview conducted by Ed Metzler, who was interviewing Robert Hamlin. Robert Hamlin was on the was on the tech force aboard the USS Enterprise. Prior to Midway, Hamlin had been aboard the Enterprise as it accompanied the USS Hornet near Japan in April 1942. He witnessed the Doolittle Raiders B B-25s taking off and heading for Japan. At Midway, after the Yorktown was sent back to Pearl Harbor, he recalled having the Yorktown's planes land on the Enterprise since they had lost their ship. He said the deck and hangar bay was crowded. They took as many planes as they possibly could, so the pilots wouldn't have to ditch their aircraft. They could fight another day. The breaking of the Japanese code led to the Battle of Midway. One person that covers this in his book, The Battle of Midway, is, is Mr. Craig Simons. It's as close to a Bible of the event as can be written. Simons argues that the victory at Midway was not just a matter of luck, pointing out that Nimitz had equal sized forces, vastly exceptional intelligence, and surprise on the side. Nimitz had a compelling hand, and he expected to win the battle. His assurance in this victory, according to Simons, was that because of the crypto intelligence code breaking, he knew where the Japanese fleet were going and when they would be near Midway. The Japanese, on the other hand, had no clue that the Americans, one, had broke their code, or two, had brought such a sizable force to the area. Essentially, Nimitz had set a trap, and though Simons research, and through Simons' research, he was able to explain how it occurred and the why the Americans were so successful. Another book on the subject was written by E.B. Potter and Admiral Nimitz and covers the entire war in the Pacific. But in Chapter 2, they cover the Battle of Midway and give a fantastic overview of the battle. The code breaking that allowed the U.S. to be at Midway is discussed as the biggest key to surprising the Japanese at Midway. And in a matter of five minutes on June 4th, three of the four Japanese carriers were sunk by U.S. warplanes. Nimitz credits the element of surprise afforded by the crypto intelligence as the key factor in the victory. Next book that discusses the issue of code breaking. Intelligence is a crucial element in the military tactic of surprise. The spectacular victory of the Battle Midway, occurring so closely after the devastating disaster at Pearl Harbor, revealed that Admiral Nimitz had acquired an appreciation for the importance of intelligence. Lieutenant Colonel Markham, in her book, examined how intelligence and the strategy of surprise influenced the Battle Midway. Markham details the crypto intelligence of the code breakers involved with breaking the Japanese code which set the stage for the American victory there, which would be the turning point in the Pacific War. Many of my grandfather's war stories began with the sentence, quote, I was south of the equator before my 18th birthday, and there'd be some kind of story, end quote. I was lucky to have someone who witnessed firsthand the battle midway from the deck of the USS Pensacola. This is where this battle is significant and important to me. William Corey was my grandfather, but before he was that, he was a diesel mechanic aboard the Pensacola, heading out to the vast Pacific Ocean, and eventually a midway in 1942. He quit school at 16 years old in Goshen, Indiana, and like many boys his age, joined the military to fight tyranny and imperialism. He lied about his age. He said they did not need to copy his birth certificate. He joined the Navy and headed to boot camp. He wanted to learn to be a mechanic, so after boot camp, he was able to get assigned as a diesel mechanic aboard the Pensacola. His first action will be during the Battle of Midway. 
During the battle, he stated he brought supplies of those fighting. He never said what those supplies were, but I assume it was ammunition. He passed away when I was 22 years old, so most of the stories were about his buddies or on the ship or getting to see a Pacific Island or something along those lines. He was on board the ship until the Japanese surrender where they went back to Pearl Harbor, then eventually to San Diego where he was discharged on December 31st, 1945. He would soon move back to Indiana and down to Bradenton in Florida before settling in Orlando. He never earned his high school diploma, but because he was a veteran, he was able to land a job with the Florida Highway Patrol. He worked, he worked with the Highway Patrol for 40 years until he retired. He spent a lot of his off time tinkering with anything that had a motor. He always told me that the power of the pen was mightier than the sword and would often implore me to get my college degree. I'm here pursuing my degree in part because he urged me to. So I am honoring a member of the greatest generation by completing my education. I'm lucky enough to get to tell you about my grandfather who was only famous to me. There are many William Corys with grandchildren who would like to honor their family members who fought at Midway. Adding a replica of the Midway Monument in Washington, D.C. would allow those descendants to place a place honor their war heroes. That's why Midway matters to me.